Good morning. Good morning. I need you to be quiet. Very good. So I'm going to start with a word of prayer and then give you some instructions, some guidelines, both for chapel and school in general. Some are just reminders and some are instructions. And then Dr. Taylor is going to come and share with us today from the book of Acts. So I'm going to start with a, a word of prayer. So let's bow your head. Oh, first, you can take off your mask. So one key thing as you come into chapel, you need to leave your mask on until you're seated. Seating is going to be every other seat, every other row. So if you look at where you're seated, most of you are seated pretty good right now. But as, as long as you come in and you're every other seat, every other row will be good to go. And then when you're instructed, that's when you'll be able to take your mask off in chapel. So I'm going to open with a word of prayer. So let's bow your heads. Dear God, we thank you for today. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity we have to come and um, learn about you both in school, but also to hear about your word, to hear about what you choose to speak to us through your word and through a person. And so we just thank you for the opportunity we have to do that, that we have the freedom to do that. We pray for your protection and just ask that you will give us a good day today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So first of all, I wanted to say you guys have done a great job settling into a really different routine to start this school year. Uh, we have really high expectations of God and of you. So we know that things like COVID don't surprise God. He knew it was coming, and he knows what he wants to do in each of your lives during this time. So we have really high expectations of God and what he wants to do in us and in you this school year. We also have really high expectations of you because we know God has gifted each of you. He has given you a huge amount of potential, and part of our job is to help you uncover that, to help you develop that. And so we're really excited about the opportunity to do that in person this school year. So I wanted to, to go through some, some guidelines. First of all, you're doing a great job with masks, but it's a routine you have to settle into. I know for me, I walked out of my house today, and I forgot my mask. It's the first day all school year that I've forgotten, but I've been doing this since July. So I've had a long time to develop a habit, and today I forgot. I walked out of my house without a mask. Now I have an extra in my car, so I was able to grab that, but... This is a routine we have to get used to. So when you come to school and you get out of your car, you put on a mask, and you wear it the whole school day, other than when you're seated in class or eating lunch. But you wear it until the end of the day, until you get in your car, or until you get to practice or a club activity, something like that. And so it's really important after school to remember that the bell that dismisses school doesn't mean your masks come off. So that's, that's one area that we need to, to keep working on. So chapel is going to be a little bit different this school year. Obviously, we're in the gym. We're not in the cafetorium. So that's going to feel different. We're spaced out more than usual, so that feels different. And then things are just going to look different. But we'll get used to it. It will become a normal routine for us. So one thing I've already mentioned is you're going to wear your mask coming in. And you're going to leave them on until you're told to take them off. Today we don't have worship, but normally we will have worship to start chapel. And so one thing during worship is we're still going to wear our masks. It, it might feel a little weird to sing with a mask on. But the important thing is who we're singing to doesn't change. And he can still hear us. Most importantly, he knows what we're singing in our hearts. And, and so that's one thing that I want to stress for worship in chapel. Our, our guidelines, the first guideline is when we worship, everybody stands up. You guys do a great job with that. Some of my high schoolers 
start to think they're a little bit too cool and they don't want to stand. You guys do a great job with that. And so everybody stands up. And then you have two options when you stand up. It's either sing or stand quietly. Sometimes our mood isn't ready to worship, and that's our fault. Because God doesn't change. Right? God doesn't change at all. And God always deserves our worship. But sometimes that's hard for us. You might have just had a really bad morning. You might have had a bad first period. Well, the important thing is for you to stand and be quiet and at least listen, God will start to talk to you. And by the second song, you might be ready to worship again. But it's important to stand and show respect to God when we're worshiping. And so the other thing is we know not all of our students are Christians. There's some people that haven't fully accepted Jesus Christ. It's hard to worship if you're not a Christian because you don't understand really why you're worshiping. And so if that's your case, if you don't really understand why you're worshiping, first of all, just stand and be quiet and listen. But second thing is ask a teacher about it. Why do we worship? They might be able to give you some answers for that. And so stand and worship either by singing or by standing quietly respectful. Either of those are fine, but we're gonna worship pretty much every chapel. Second thing that I wanna cover real quick is when somebody comes up here to speak, what do you do? So first thing is you sit up. It's a lot easier in bleachers than in comfortable cafetorium chairs. It's harder to slouch in a bleacher when there's no back, so that's a good thing. But you sit up, you pay attention, and you're quiet. Because here's the thing. God has this weird way where God can speak to you through someone else and speak to each of you differently. And so our speakers, today you're going to hear from Dr. Taylor. Dr. Taylor has put a lot of thought into what God wants him to say. It's not what he wants to say. It's what God wants him to say. But more importantly, God knows what he wants you to hear. And it's going to be different for everybody. But you're not going to hear if you're not listening. And so we need you to sit up and pay attention. And most importantly, be quiet so everyone around you can pay attention. Because God wants to speak to you. That's, that's kind of the cool thing about being a Christian is God wants to talk to you every chance he gets. But we don't always stop long enough to listen. And chapel is a space where we do that. We can stop and we can listen and see what he has to say. The other thing is, and, and this is more a cafetorium issue than a gym, there's no food or drink in the gym, so there's no food or drink in chapel. So two other things that I want to mention real quick. First of all, clubs are go going to be starting up in September. Sponsors know about this, but if you want to be a part of a club or if you want to start a club, talk to one of your teachers. These will be starting up again in September, so they know the guidelines for us to meet with clubs. And then the second thing is D groups. D groups are going to start next week. Hopefully everybody got a chance to sign up on Tuesday. If you didn't, we're working through that to make sure you're in a D group. And so next week you'll be able to see everyone who's in your D group. You'll find out your leader. You'll find out where you're going to meet. And next Thursday will be our first chance to meet in D groups. D groups are a really neat way for you to get to know a teacher or an administrator or we've got some pastors from Hebron coming over. But they're not going to be teaching you in class. There's not going to be any tests. They just want to get to know you. Some of you are going to figure this out, but probably the coolest D group is going to be Dr. Taylor's. It might sound weird that the head of school, his D group might be the coolest, but I know some of the stuff that they do, and you're going to wish you were in his group. So D groups are just a way we get to talk to you as fellow Christians, not as students or not as kids, but fellow Christians. And so we're really excited about that. So next week you're going to see locations, but next Thursday during this time, you're going to be in your first D group of the school year. So last thing that I just want to mention is keep being flexible. You guys are doing a great job this school year. We appreciate how you've been flexible with everything and the attitude that you've had. It's been a great start to the school year. And so Dr. Taylor is going to come. Make sure you sit up. Make sure you pay attention and then ask the question, what does God want me to hear through Dr. Taylor's mouth? God has something he wants you to learn today as Dr. Taylor speaks and just ask him. Because if you ask him and you listen, God's going to answer. Dr. Taylor. You got it? All right, there we go. 
There we go. All right. I guess we were sharing a channel. Hey, that Wolfgang. Am I on? Am I good? There, man. There we go. All right. Hey, that uh, I'm sure that woke you up. All right. Let me have everybody's attention again. It was just a noise. That's all it was. No explosions happened. All right. And they'll work out my sound as we're going through this. Hey, so this year we are going to work through the book of Acts. And, uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to actually work through uh, really the vast majority of the book of Acts. I think that the book of Acts provides some amazing opportunities for us to be able to really understand, one, the truth of God's word. But I also think that what it does is it ends up providing an opportunity for us to apply some very specific things to our lives that are directly tied with what's taking place in our nation right now and in our world right now. So the book of Acts, even though it is a book that's in the Bible and the Bible's been published for a really, really long time, this book still directly applies to what God is doing in us and through us, okay? And so the book of Acts is a story about the church, and, and it's really the beginnings of the church. But the, the book of Acts is also a story about the apostles. And the apostles are these 12 guys who are completely unlikely heroes. They are completely unlikely. You, if you were going to pick out people who were going to lead and who were going to change the world forever, you probably would not have picked maybe even any of these 12. And it's a story of those disciples. I'm comforted. Frankly, I, it's one of the reasons I love reading the book of Acts is because it reminds me all of the time that I also can be used for the kingdom, that God can use each and every one of us. And so it's a story about the beginning of the church. It's a story about the apostles, 12 very, very unlikely heroes. But listen, it's also and truly a story about you. What it does is it challenges each and every one of us to some really central ideas. So, so we're going to work through the book of Acts. Now, I typically will use some sort of a video as we're going through uh, uh, just about every single week. I really like things called the spoken word and some different pieces uh, of videos. The video that I'm going to play today is a little bit longer. I'm usually going to do a video that's more like two or three minutes longer. The video we're going to play today is about six minutes long. But what it's going to do is it's going to give you just kind of a, a very brief encapsulations of the book of Acts. And then literally this whole year, we're going to plug through this book. So will you guys just give your attention? Mr. Kastner is going to put up a short video. of the Apostles. The Acts of the Apostles chronicles the spread of the church. It shows how God is using the news of the gospel to take back the earth. But to understand what God is doing in these last days, we've got to go back to some of the first. We've got to go back to the book of Genesis. For when God made Adam and Eve, he made them in his image and gave them the privilege of taking the light of God's visage to every corner of creation. All of earth's inches were to be covered with God's image. That was their mission. For God's intention was that the whole world would become a place where his created ones could enjoy fellowship with the one they love where humans could dine with the divine, where the earthly and celestial could share the same table, where mankind would fellowship with God as they were meant to, and earth was to be the venue. So God told Adam and Eve to be fruitful, to grow the garden, to fill the planet, to take his light and his presence to every place on earth they could possibly inhabit. But Adam and Eve wouldn't have it. So instead of spreading God's image to the nations, they decided to spread their own. So they were separated from God and from their shared home. But God would not leave his creation alone. So in our image, he came. For our sins, he was made and earned us back a place in the garden 
by rising from the grave. But before Jesus ascended back to heaven, he told his disciples what would be the scope of their work. They would take the good news of what Jesus had earned to Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. But something else had to happen first. They were to prayerfully wait until the Holy Spirit came to give them the power and authority that was in Jesus' name. And on the day of Pentecost, in an upper room, while the disciples prayed, they heard the sound of a mighty wind and saw the Holy Spirit rest on them like a flame. Now the presence of God that was lost in the garden, the light of God that we tried to darken, had come near in a new way to fulfill an old mission, to cover creation with God's image. So he came to the disciples to make them his witnesses and to spread his church to Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, this threefold project not only shows how the gospel would go to every country and continent, but in the book of Acts, these three locations also serve as a table of contents. Part one, the gospel goes to Jerusalem, where Peter and the disciples begin the gospel's distribution. Part two, the gospel expands to Judea and Samaria, where Philip and others bring Israel's divided kingdom back under God's united rule over the area. Part three, the gospel goes to the ends of the earth as Paul and his fellow workers plant church after church. Now this three-part table of contents shows us the movement that should have been present in the book of Genesis, God's presence taken out by those who were near it. But what Adam and Eve failed to do in their flesh, God accomplished by giving his spirit. But what is it that spreads this presence? What is it that performs this reversal work? What action is enacted to secure this worldwide reach? It is this. Everywhere the disciples went, the gospel was preached. Whether it was Peter's Pentecost sermon or his plea before the rulers, whether it was Stephen's testimony and martyrdom or Philip being the Ethiopian's tutor, whether it was to God-fearing Gentiles or in pagan Greek rings, whether it was Paul in every synagogue or before any king, their message was about one thing, that Jesus is the promised savior the scriptures promised God would bring, that he died for our sins and rose from the grave to finally set humanity free. But something else happened in all three of the regions the disciples would visit. There was one work of God that would make his presence explicit. When the gospel was preached and the people would hear it, the event was marked off by an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. For Jerusalem, the Spirit came at Pentecost to show that the power who raised Jesus from the dead is now with us. For Judea and Samaria, the Spirit came through the preaching of the gospel and the laying on of hands to show that those who seemed to have worked themselves out of God's grace were still within God's plan. And when the Spirit poured out on the house of the Gentile Cornelius, God was showing that this good news was not just for one group, but was for all of us. The Holy Spirit covers page after page of the church's early story to reveal the glory of this fact, that humanity is no longer separated from God as they were back in the Garden of Eden. For they have been made into the new house of God, for they have God living within them. And something else happens as God's Spirit goes out universally. It's that the people of God start to be filled with diversity. Jews and Gentiles, Bereans and Ephesians, God-fearers and pagans, Romans and Judeans start to come around the table with other nations and regions. For that 
is the reason God told the disciples to go, to leave Jerusalem, so the whole earth might become the new Garden of Eden. Now, this church on a mission has come to us so that we may continue taking the gospel to the whole world until it is the venue where people from every tribe, every language, every people, every nation can come around the table and break bread with the God that made them. The Acts of the Apostles now continues with us, the church. So may we take the good news of Jesus to our neighbors and to the nations until the light of Jesus fills the ends of the earth. All right. Thank you so much for the lights. I appreciate that. So a cool video, right? A cool video that, that begins to tell the story about the book of Acts. And so we're going to hit two points today. One is the radical message of the gospel. I think so often, listen, we look at the Bible and we look at Jesus and we look at the disciples as somehow tame. We look at them somehow as, I mean, I'm just going to be honest, sometimes the way that we hear people talk about Jesus and we hear people talk about the disciples, it almost sounds boring. And and listen, I just want to tell you that, that the radical message that we see in the new church, the radical message that we see at the beginning and the inception of this church is completely upsetting the world. Like it completely turns their ideas on their heads. And so we're going to walk through three ideas with this first point. The first one is the radical message of the gospel. Now, when I'm jumping in on the word, I'm going to jump right into the word. And so in this section of scripture here, we see in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. And we, I got some serious glare on there. All right. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, in this section, I want to point out some really important things. The first thing, and they introduced it here in this video, that we're going to see the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is a brand new idea. The Holy Spirit is something that they haven't known what this is, and and yet it's one part of the Trinity. Now, here's the coolest part for all of us in this room, is that this idea of the Holy Spirit is for everyone. So if you are a believer, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you have the power of the Holy Spirit. I I am constantly amazed that, like, so this year we're talking about being bold. We're talking about having a courage that is inside of you. And sometimes, I know that for me, I don't feel like I have that boldness. I don't feel like I have that courage. And here's the truth. I'm going to tell you my secret. I don't. I don't have that boldness. I don't have that courage. My courage and my boldness is borrowed. My courage and my boldness is borrowed from a loving God who sent his son to this earth and then who gave us the Holy Spirit. And so this power is for everyone. Second part of that verse is that you will be my witnesses. And then it talks about how you're going to be my witnesses. It says in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so in that section of scripture, we see this idea that every single one of us are meant to have an impact. I was chatting with the staff earlier on, uh, it feels like a year ago, but it was just a few weeks ago, uh, in our pre-planning. Uh, but we were talking in pre-planning, I was saying, using the example of, of, of waking up in the morning, and maybe you're staying at a lake, and the lake is so smooth in the morning, just placid water. And then you just throw one stone into the water. And then from that stone comes these circles, right? You get this this drop, and then you get these concentric circles that move out from the center. And that's really what this verse is talking about, that we're meant to have an impact. And and it's meant to be here, like he says, hey, from where you're at. So we might say, in Decula Road, and in Decula, and in Gwinnett County, and in Georgia, and in America, and to the world. And here's the thing. If you're here and you know Jesus Christ as your Savior— you're also supposed to be a part of that impact. You're supposed to, there, there's nothing in the Bible says that you don't get to have an impact until you reach a certain age. There's nothing that says that. You're supposed to be a part of that impact. And that is a crucial thing to understand. Next thing, 
the radical message of the gospel, and this is a message for everyone. Now, I, we will talk a lot about that this year because there's no way that I can overemphasize just how nutty this is, okay? That when, when this message is received and the idea that God, the creator of the universe, came here for every single person is absolutely mind-blowing, okay? Realize that in this era, that this message of God, this Jewish God, would have only been for the Jews, that that message would have only been for one specific group of people, that they were, they were the chosen people, right? And so there's a change, there's a transition that takes place where this message is now for everyone. Now look, at this is the essence of the gospel. We'll talk a lot about the gospel as we're working through this year, but this is the essence of it. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins for the promises for you and your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And I love in this section of scripture here at the end that it emphasizes that this is for all. This is for everyone. Prior to this, if there was a religious gathering, everybody looked the same, had the same mindset, came from the same spot, right? And then Jesus steps into this place, Jesus steps into this world, and everything changes. Where instead, now Jesus says, hey listen, we're, this, this message, this message of love is meant for every single person. So guess what starts to end up happening? Is that the upper room that was referenced in this, in this, uh, the, this video, the upper room, in that upper room, there's men and there's women, which prior to that, a lot of times it was only men who were, who were allowed to be in certain section of worship. Jesus says, nope, there are no gender borders, okay? So Jesus, there's men and women in, in this upper room. There's about 120 people who are gathered together at the beginning of this church, right? It's men and it's women. In that room, there are people who were, had brown skin and there are people who had black skin and there are people who had lighter skin. There were every, every different brand of person in the world. There were people in there that they, they, in, if they even name it, but there are 16 different countries that are represented in that room. And so this message becomes a message for everyone. And, and again, I, in America, we can't quite understand that because we really had this idea of Christianity for pretty much the entire time we've been a nation. Uh, and so we can't grasp just how radical that is, but this message is a message for everyone. And here's the third thing, is that this message is a message of unity. And in that section of scripture, it says this, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and, par- and prayers. All who believed were together and had all things in common. And in that section of scripture, it underscores what they're united to, what they're united to. So these guys have to make a decision, okay? And, and, and if I can just tell you, this is why I think the book of Acts is so directly tied to everything that we're going through right now as well. But these guys have to make a decision as to how they're going to define themselves. In our first day of school, I had a chance to chat with each and every one of your grades. And we talked about the idea of how we define ourselves. What, how, and I, I used the Sherlock Holmes analogy and you had to try to figure out who I was and, and, and what, you know, what I was taking, what was going on with me. Uh, and we talk about how we're going to define ourselves. What is our identity? These guys had to make the decision about what their identity was going to be, okay? And here's where sometimes things get mixed up. Sometimes people say, my greatest identity is basketball, is football. That's my greatest identity. My greatest identity is what neighborhood I come from. My greatest identity is what kind of stuff I have. My greatest identity is what kind of family I come from. My greatest identity is the color of my skin. My greatest identity is how much money I have. A lot of times people use so many different things to say, what is your greatest identity? And Jesus steps into this world and tears all of that aside. All of that aside. And he says, your greatest identity is in me, is in Jesus Christ. And that's the challenge, and that's where this church changes the world. These men and women change the world. Why? Because they made the decision to say, all of those things are secondary to who I am in Christ. And so here, I love that they said they were united in everything. And really, we could say, well, you know, 
uh, were they really united in everything? Listen, they were united in everything that truly mattered. And I, I love that idea. Here's the second part, the radical messengers of the gospel. Now, we're going to talk a lot about uh, these people who really impacted uh, the kingdom and impacted our world. But just here's kind of in a nutshell about who we're going to meet as we're traveling through this journey with Acts. So here, here I'm just going to really, really quickly summarize these guys, okay? Peter. Peter's a fisherman. He's married. Uh, uh, and I actually meant to say he talks before he thinks. He talks before he thinks. A lot of times people say he's got a, he's got a foot-shaped mouth. Uh, that's just who Peter was. Here's a guy who, who Jesus had told him, you will deny me three times. And, and that section of scripture in the gospel where Peter, Peter says, no, Lord, I would go, I would die for you. I would do anything for you. And, and Jesus says, no, listen, you're going to deny me three times. And then the third time he denies Jesus to this little girl in this, in, in this courtyard. And then he makes eye contact with Jesus and the rooster crows. I mean, that's Peter, right? And yet Peter goes on to be a hero in the faith. Peter dies by being crucified upside down. He says that he was unworthy to be crucified in the same way as his Savior. So he's, he dies by being crucified upside down. Andrew, Andrew's also a fisherman. He's a humble and quiet guy. You know, a lot of times we think God can only use people who are kind of out there, you know, type A personalities. Not true. Andrew is the one who introduces people to Jesus. Andrew's constantly bringing people to Jesus. He's quiet, he's humble, but he goes on to be a radical follower of Jesus Christ, and he dies a, a death as well that is violent, and he is crucified. James, a fisherman, brother to John, they're called the sons of thunder. Uh, they're very emotional, they're very passionate, and they, they, sometimes they definitely don't, do not think before they talk. Uh, James went on to be a missionary, he was, and he followed Jesus immediately, and, G, and James died by being beheaded. John, the other son of thunder, he's a fisherman. The disciple that Jesus loved. It's actually who Jesus' mom went to live with after Jesus, after Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Only disciple not to die a violent death. Here's our next four. Philip. Philip is a cynic. He has a negative attitude about most things, okay? He's a bean counter. In him, Jesus' strength is made perfect, however. And so here's this guy who tends to look at his cup half empty, and yet God chooses to use him. Now, he goes on to be a radical missionary. Look at how Philip died. He was stoned to death, and then they took his dead body and, and crucified him. Nathaniel, or sometimes called Bartholomew, he began as a bit prejudiced. We even see some things in there. But he was an honest man. At least he, he wanted to know the truth. He shared the gospel. He went from here. He went to India. Uh, he was killed in Armenia. He was beaten, then crucified, then beheaded, just in, case, just in case he wasn't really dead. Matthew, tax collector, he's hated by people. He, he, but he, because of what, what kind of the darkness that he grew up with, he recognized the grace of God. He was killed by uh, the king of Ethiopia with a spear. Thomas, doubting Thomas, he began as being so skeptical that he was os often pessimistic. Uh, he grew to have courage, however. He started the Christian church in India, and he was executed by a spear. James the Less. Not a whole lot is known about this James. He's not heroic, but he was chosen by God. He was most likely crucified in Sinai. Simon the Zealot. He's a radical political activist, but he became a radical follower of Jesus Christ. He went to the west coast of Africa. Then they say that he went to England. And then in England, they say that he was actually crucified in England. Thaddeus or Jude, little known uh, about him, but he needed to know the whole plan. He became a missionary to Edessa, and there's actually a historical account that through Jesus Christ, he actually healed the king of Edessa. Uh, he came back to a different country. He was clubbed to death for his faith. Judas Iscariot, he's the traitor. He's the one that I, I know that we all know about. He sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. He witnessed the truth of Jesus, yet he never committed his life to Jesus Christ. So here are 12 very unlikely heroes, with the exception of Judas, Judas of Iscariot. I always wondered why Jesus brought in Judas of Iscariot. Like, I always wondered that. If he was going to pick 12 to be, able to, to be able to impact the world, why would he pick Judas Iscariot? And, I, and really, I, I've wrestled with that for a long, long time. And here's, here's kind of the answer that I came up with, okay? Here's a guy, Judas Iscariot, who gets to see the work of Jesus every day of his life. 
that he has, he has seen Jesus heal. He has seen Jesus raise people from the dead. He has seen Jesus break down the barriers of color and religion and all of these things. Judas is right there. He's got a front row seat to be able to see the truth of Jesus in everything. And yet he never accepts his message. And you know, I often wondered why God would have chosen Judas. But ultimately, these 12 people are, are a lesson for us. They're a story for us. And I got to say this, okay? How many people come to a Christian school where you get to hear about Christ every day? You get to hear about who Jesus is. And yet you've never let that message sink into your heart. That you've never been transformed for eternity. And listen, I know, I've been in Christian schools for 27 years now. I know that there are kids who will sit in chairs just like this. You'll hear messages just like this. And yet, yet you never let it transform you. And honestly, Judas is an example of that. That he saw Jesus, yet he would not let his heart be changed. I want to encourage you this year to let your heart be changed. I want to encourage you this year to look for ways that you're going to be bold. Let me just tell you, God's working that in me as well, okay? I I've, have been doing this a long time. I mentioned in, in my admin meeting yesterday, I think I've done a lot of things in my own power. And I, I want, I want to challenge God radically. And I want to be a part of what that looks like. For me to try to accomplish things that I know I can't do in my own power. But instead, I surrender that to God. I encourage you this year to be challenged with the idea of what is God calling you to do? Hey, listen, maybe one of you as middle schoolers is being called to start a Bible study with your own group. That might be something you're, you're being bold to. Uh, you know, sometimes the most bold acts can happen in even a situation just like this, where you'll see a kid and you're kind of plunking down with all of your friends that you've been friends with for 100 years, but there might be another kid sitting close to you who isn't sitting with anyone. Sometimes boldness is just the boldness of kindness, that you're walking over and sitting with that kid and making sure that, that you're showing them what the love of Jesus is supposed to look like. This year, I want to challenge you to be bold. Let's be a different kind of school. Let's be a different kind of Hebron, where we place Christ at the first, that we say all of these barriers that the world says are important, we're going to tear those barriers down. And we're going to say, hey, what's most important in my identity is my identity with who Jesus is. So that is my challenge for you. But I also say that that is my challenge that God has for me as well. That I'm being challenged to live with boldness as a leader at this new place and to make sure that I'm not only tackling things that I can do, but I'm tackling things that I know only God can do. Let me close out in a word of prayer. And hey, let me say this too. If there are people in here in the middle school group who are interested in kind of praying us out at the end of chapels, I would love to always have a student praying out, praying us out in chapels. And if you are interested in that, hey, just come and chat with me. And, uh, and I would love to be able to, to have you praying us out as well, okay? But let me, let me pray us out on this first one. Father God, I just want to thank you, Lord, so much for who you are. I thank you, Father, for the love that you have for us. I thank you, Father, for the powerful story that we see in the book of Acts. And I pray, Father, that we would, as middle schoolers, make the choice to be bold for who you are. As we jump in on D groups next week, that this would be entirely about who you are in our lives. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, now I am told, Mr. Annie, you're coming back in. Hold on. Let me flick mine off before you flick yours off. Okay, quick instructions for dismissal.